All right. Hello, and thank you for joining us for this Hagley History Hangout. I am Gregory Hargreaves, Program Officer in the Center for the History of Business Technology and Society at the Hagley Museum and Library. And I am being joined today by Dr. Trish Kala, Assistant Professor in the Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University, Qatar. And uh, she has done research at uh, the Hagley Library uh, supported by exploratory grant as well as a Henry Bellin DuPont research grant uh, for her project uh, titled The Graveyard Shift, Coal and Citizenship in the Age of Energy Crisis, which is um, a project exploring the post-World War II political economy of coal and its role in the struggles over the production and consumption of energy as a matter of civic rights and responsibilities, the struggle over what the professor terms energy citizenship. Thank you so much for joining me today, Trish. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Um, well, let's start uh, with your work. Uh, what is energy citizenship and what is its significance uh, in, in your project? It's a really great question. So I think a lot of our discussions about citizenship, or rather, sorry, about energy, tend to focus on either production or consumption. And in the course of doing research that was really heavily focused on the production side, I came to see that approach as more and more inadequate. Um, and what I saw the miners that I was studying, the language that they were using was really around this idea of rights and obligations, very similar to um, you know, how we sort of theorize the politics of citizenship, right? That rights are accompanied by obligations, so you don't have liberties that exist without obligations to the people around you. Um, you know, concepts which, you know, scholars like Linda Kerber have really put at the center of the American conception of citizenship, particularly by people um, who have had to make claims to it, who have been denied particular aspects um, of citizenship. And so citizenship became a really powerful way to think about the bonds that existed between consumers and producers, um, and to frame those bonds as not just economic or environmental, but also as deeply political. Um, as things that were the product of how energy was governed, you know, where the risk would fall in an energy society, in an energy regime, you know, who would be asked to bear it, um, and what reason were they given for why they should take those risks, um, which were, you know, these decisions were almost um, never purely economic, no matter how powerfully economics did play into them. And so for me, citizenship was really a way of getting at that extra economic component of energy relationships in the modern United States. And who are some of the chief actors in this story? Well, so in the original version, which was my dissertation, it was coal miners. Um, but that's really a product of, you know, the earlier questions that I was interested in were about the United Mine Workers, um, the rise and fall of the union in the 20th century. Um, but, you know, most like most projects that changed pretty radically over the course of doing the research. But I think, you know, the fundamental mark of those early forays into the United Mine Workers records were still there. Um, I think, you know, as the project has sort of been expanded, like the real question then is like, if you're saying it's about both production and consumption, well, how does it get from one place to the other, right? You can, the coal miners records are, they're rich and they're wonderful, but they don't account for the consumption side. And so I wanted to make sure I was giving equal weight um, to both sides of the story. Is that where the Hagley collections come in? Yes, yes, no. It was, so, I mean, the Hagley has this absolutely wonderful collection of, from the Pennsylvania Power and Light Company, mm. um, which is, you know, really, I mean, a fantastically complete set of records in some ways, right? Um, you know, sometimes things can be pretty cherry picked. Um, and I think, you know, Pennsylvania Power and Light made a particularly uh, good choice for this, not just because they're actually situated right on top of some of the coal fields. So right, their service area includes Luzerne and Lackawanna counties, right, which are the sort of the heart of the anthracite coal fields. They actually are the biggest consumer of anthracite coal in the world in the 1950s, which I actually learned from the trip. Um, and, you know, but as the, the anthracite uh, industry sort of just falls away, they're left to wonder, you know, where should we go? And they go to Bituminous. So they're a coal-fired uh, utility. They have service area in the coal fields. And, you know, I think in contrast to how a lot of utilities are portrayed in scholarship, I think PPNL had a really forward-thinking role about the role they would play in the region. 
Um, and they had executives like Jack Busby who were really active in policy. And so you're in this tiny area of central eastern Pennsylvania, which, you know, I think the, you know, has Harrisburg, it has Allentown, but, you know, doesn't include Philadelphia, doesn't include New York City, um, really ends up playing an outsized role in shaping the politics of the utility. Um, and so it sort of made a great foray into it, and I think is, has been a really productive way to start to answer the second part of the question. Well, have there been any particularly exciting uh, discoveries of sources? Yeah, so I, this visit, I've been focusing almost exclusively on their communications department. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the challenges of this has been, you know, I'm trained as a labor historian, so I'm used to working um, with sources that are often not written by the people who they're about. But here I really have like to, I get to grapple with these actors in their full complexity. Um, and I've sort of gotten to know all the, the members of the communications department in some ways very intimately right through these memos that they're writing to each other. Um, and so I think, you know, it's not a particularly single document, but I think really trying to grapple with the ethic of public service that they felt, which I think is hard to imagine from a lot of utility executives today, um, that it's not just sort of a veneer, but something that they take quite seriously. Um, and thinking about what that means in terms of how they manage that role as mediator between the people who source fuel and then burn it and then deliver electricity to their customers. Um, my other favorite set of, of uh, documents is actually a set of letters after a blackout um, and what they reveal about how ordinary people experience energy in their everyday life. And so on the one hand, you have extremes from all of these people who would, uh, you know, basically be trying to recoup their lost wages because they're blaming the power company for them oversleeping for work because their electric alarm clock went out. To the, all the way on the other side, you get, you know, these letters which show people who imagine they have this very intimate relationship with their utility company. Um, that, you know, oh, the power was only out for an hour. It was great. Thanks so much for sending out, you know, very specifically named people that the people in the main office would have had no idea who they were. Um, and I think, you know, what it, it shows first that people expected some sort of upheaval in their everyday, like energetic lives, right? That a, a blackout was not something that was completely out of the blue to them but rather part of this relationship they had with their mm. utility company. Um, but yeah, so those are my favorite kind of, I like to read around the edges of sources to find surprising things. Um, but I think, you know, a lot of it has been pretty straightforward. Like this is where we bought the coal from and here's where it went. And this is how we burned it. But to me, I think that's exciting. So, you know, I guess to everyone their own. Well, uh, does the role as an intermediary in this energy system um, make the utility a kind of kingmaker, if you will, in terms of energy citizenship, or what? How else does it fit into uh, that frame? Well, I think in the energy regime that governed the post-war United States, post-1945 United States, you know, everyone's choices were fairly constrained, right? So on the the fuel side, you had to have someone to buy it. Right. And you had to keep labor costs down, all sorts of things. But for the utilities, you know, they're sort of getting it from both ends. So they have to think about fuel costs. They have to think about the actual sites. Will the people who live around the site allow it to be built? Um, how will they sort of articulate it as a benefit to the community? And so for PPNL, really what that means is they're like heavily involved in industrial development and building up their customer base through bringing in new industries who generate employment, um, creating rec recreational areas. And I think, again, cultivating within the company a, a very strong ethic of service. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the other side, right, they have these customers whose expectations they're managing. And so then, you know, the period that I'm looking at, right, is the 1970s. That's when inflation hits. And so I think it sort of really tightens the belt on PPL. So they're not really able to have the kind of choice they might necessarily want to, right? So coal is expensive. It's very dirty. Um, it has labor troubles. Uh, and, you know, PPNL does invest in at least five or six unit trains to transport coal from their mines in the west, in western Pennsylvania, um, to their sites at Bronner Island and Martins Creek. But on the other hand, they say, you know, well, coal is expensive, oil is not secure, and there's not enough, there's not enough of it. Um, atomic power is something they invest heavily in, but it just doesn't really come to fruition. And by the time they're ready to bring their plant um, near Berwick online, right, that's right around when Three Mile Island happens. Right. Um, and so I think, you know, they, 
in some ways, right, they do play a much bigger role than we've appreciated. As, you know, when I say we, people who are mostly had started from the fuel side, but, you know, their own choices are also quite limited. And so I think they're sort of trying to keep themselves balanced on a high wire. Um, and part of what that means is that they had to figure out, you know, what I, what was the initial surprise to me when I was doing, before I started the research here was that, you know, the utilities have no formal relationship with coal miners at all. And yet what coal miners do has a very big impact on, is there enough coal where the reserves last through a hard winter? Um, and so the utilities have to be really creative in sort of how they intervene politically, right? Because they're heavily regulated. They don't have direct connections to the people producing the fuel in many cases. Um, and that's why the communications department is such a wonderful place to start, right? Because it's all their PR. Well, um, I, you've mostly answered this question, but I, I think it might bear reiteration. So how does the energy crisis of the 70s appear in the archive? Sounds yeah. like perhaps, as you say, it further constrains the choices of some of the participants in the industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so for viewers who maybe are not quite as familiar with the history of the energy crisis, I think there is a popular myth that it sort of starts with the 73 oil embargo, mm -hmm. and then it's sort of capped off at the end by the Iranian revolution. Um, but, you know, the utilities were really talking about an energy crisis by early 1970. And so for them, it really came from, um, you know, in the post-1945 U.S., energy use, particularly of electricity, skyrockets. You know, you have more and more people um, you know, owning their own homes, having more and more electric appliances, you have greater electrification of industry. And so demand for electricity has been doubling pretty much every decade, and they sort of expect that to continue. At the same time, the amount of fuel that is available becomes more and more constrained. There are issues with rail cars being available to transport fuel that's coming by rail. And so that's one of the reasons that PPNL buys these trains because they want to be able to be like, we can actually, you know, we have trains running on a passenger car schedule and they're going to go from, you know, these mines near Altoona and they're going to go all the way over to the eastern side of the state. Um, and then on the other hand, you know, the natural gas is like the really big pinch. Um, and so PPNL, because it's mostly coal, right, the direct supplies of oil and natural gas aren't quite as big of a deal for them. Um, but, you know, coal at that point, they are having strikes like nobody's business, right? There's like a three week strike in the West Virginia fields that shuts down production for a while. And then basically safety strikes are just continuing at these massive, massive rates. And so the coal, the issues with coal are like, can you get a train to transport it? And can you get, um, enough of it in a secure enough way to keep up a two month stockpile, which is the minimum you want to have on hand. Um, so but in the end for PPNL, it doesn't really manifest into like there's an actual shortage of coal. Later in the 1970s, I haven't gotten to that component yet, but that's when the air pollution stuff really starts to kick in. Um, and so air pollution is a problem for them even in the early 1970s, um, because at that point they're already contending with the Clean Air Act. Um, but those, as those regulations get tighter and tighter, I think it's going to become more of an issue for them. Um, but so yeah, all of that is to say is that the, the energy crisis just looks different when you look at it from a different perspective. And so when you don't start from the perspective of oil, but you instead start from this sort of tense place that the utility company is in between, on the one hand, you have these unstable sources of fuel, which are all unstable for their own particular reasons, which makes policy responses hard, or at least unified policy responses to that hard. Um, and then you have, on the other hand, people who have really come to associate electricity with their standard of living, right? And so I actually found this incredible document that says, you know, even if you give people good jobs and they have all this money, like if they don't have the electricity to use with it, like, are they even Americans who have like a great standard of living? Um, you know, and another really, one of my favorite finds actually is a, they have this picture of this very angry woman and like try telling the lady she'll have to go back to washing by hand. Um, you know, because her electric dishwasher no longer works. Um, so for PPNL, they get try and get around this a couple of ways. They try and expand the number of facilities they had. So they put about a one point six billion dollars into building new facilities. They build these new car trains and they diversify um, the fuel sources they're using. So you know, before nineteen seventy, they're basically exclusively coal, um, with a couple of exceptions, a couple of small hydropower plants. 
Um, and after that, they open a couple of oil burning plants. And these are obviously, they're burning residual fuel oil. They're not burning like crude. Um, and they open, uh, set up these plans to open a nuclear power station. So I think that also is sort of reflective of trying to meet a world where fuels are not a certain, a certain bet. Well, then are there implications um, for a future of energy citizenship in perhaps a, uh, in a clean energy economy? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a really important question. And so one of the things that this research has suggested to me is that, you know, we don't have a good way of conceptualizing energy supply along the whole chain, right? So mm -hmm. what bonds people together? Yes, there's the sort of producers bonded to, to the consumers, but I think another component, and I actually started to encounter this right before I met with you today, is about waste. Um, and there's actually a lot of great materials in the PPNL collection about waste both thermal pollution from plants, because they're all built up along the Susquehanna River, um, as well as air pollution. Um, and so for them, right, they have actually a, a coal plant that's situated right on the Delaware River. And all of the pollution blows not into Pennsylvania, but into a small town, in a small working class town in New Jersey. Um, and they got a bunch of complaint letters from them. Mm. But so even though with something like hydropower, right, it still raises a whole bunch of questions about, you know, who can be displaced, um, who has access to the rec recreation facilities. Um, and so I think, you know, recognizing that all energy systems comes with costs and benefits, right? And that those have to be distributed and they're not just something that can be left to the market, right? That they have to be um, seen as things that are value laden. They have to be things that are distributed um, democratically, right? And through a system that can account for the full spectrum and doesn't just sort of throw it off onto the next state or onto another country or onto a international water body, you know. Or um, onto future generations. Or onto future generations, absolutely. Mm, yeah, and I think that's a, a pretty important lesson to take with us. Um, I wonder how much you characterize your experience conducting research at Hagley? Yeah, I mean, I love archival research. So, you know, if it was up to me, I would just spend like a year here just like pouring over every single document, but I think, you know, the staff here are really incredible and they're just, they have such a deep knowledge of the archival holdings. Um, and it really makes sort of wading through these enormous collections uh, a little bit easier because even though I think PPL has something like the main collection is maybe a couple hundred or something, it's like over a hundred boxes though. And, um, you know, but even that it's these very big dense things with like lots of memos back and forth and um, it takes a while to sort of work your way through. So I think having the sort of library support staff that are really able to sort of help walk you through the collection just makes a really big difference. I, I like to say research is a team sport. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, well, well, thank you so much for speaking with me. And I really look forward to uh, reading more of your work. Um, and for the audience, if you'd like more Hagley History Hangouts, please go to our website at hagley.org. And um, for more information on the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society, and our research grant and fellowship programs can be found on the website as well. Uh, uh, Trish, thank you so much. Uh, this was uh, uh, really interesting. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Take care. Bye.